many of you are glad that Jesus won your victory? The thing that scares us, the thing that unnerves us, it took him, but it couldn't hold him. We're subject to death, but death cannot hold us because it could not hold him. Some people think that Jesus got up because the angel called him. No, Jesus said, I have the power to lay down my life, and I have the power to take it back. Don't get it twisted. I lost, but he won. I can recover from my failures and my bad choices because he won. My second and third and fourth bad choices, I can come back to church because he won. You've been saved your whole life. Can you turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 17? 1 Kings chapter 17. We'll read together verses 7 to 10. 1 Kings chapter 17. If you're like me and you didn't memorize the books of the Bible, but you sang them, it's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings. I failed that part of the exam in seminary. You got to take a Bible entrance exam. I got an 81. You had to get an 80. But that part I failed. Got to list all of the books of the New Testament in order. I'll read in your hearing. I'm reading from the New International Version of the Bible. Whatever version you have, you can read along with me. If you don't have it, it's also on the screen. The Bible reads, Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? Bow your heads with me as we consider for our time together. I've got to go. I've got to go. Father in heaven, we remember when it was 1999. We didn't know what was going to happen when the clock struck midnight. Here we are almost 20 years later. We woke up this morning because of your grace. We woke up this morning because of your mercy. We woke up to a new day because you saw fit in your infinite wisdom to give us another chance. We ask that you open our eyes and our hearts to see you in a new way. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. The brook is dry. The ravens are not coming back. The water and meat that was delivered FedEx has been canceled. The cool breeze that air conditioned Elijah's skin now seems warmer. The sky has turned to brass, but it has been scorching the earth for the last three years. The temperature near the brook was lowered because of the water flowing. But now that the brook has dried up, the temperature rises, causing the skin of Elijah to rise as well. The once comfortable place has become an uncomfortable place. The drought that affects every person and afflicts every person under heaven is now getting to Elijah. But it gets to him after three years. He wakes up expecting the raven to have his breakfast in bed. He looks, but there is no bird. He scans the horizon, but he sees no wings. For the last 1,080 days, God has provided a meal every morning, but this morning there is nothing. He turns and he sees the brook that was once gushed with water is now dry to the bone. And instead of a five-course meal, Instead of Grubhub or Uber Eats coming to the brook, the Bible says the word of the Lord comes to him. The word of 
the Lord comes to him. God does not send bread. He does not send meat, but he sends a word. This word does not fill his stomach. This word does not quench his thirst. This word does not lessen his hunger pains. And Elijah has to take inventory of the last three years. God provides bread and meat every morning and every evening, and he drinks water from the same brook. But today is different. Today it is dry, and we see that the water that Elijah drinks every day and the food that was supplied to him was not because of him. The meat that he eats twice a day is according to the command of the Lord. And this season of plenty has run its course. And in its place, all you send me is a word. I don't know about you, but if Elijah was like me, I would ask God, um, why didn't you tell me today was going to be the day? If you would have given me advance notice, I would have conserved the water. I would have tried to preserve the meat. If you had given me a warning, God, why did you decide today to cut off the supply? Elijah is going to learn the lesson that you cannot preserve God's blessing from one day to the next. All you can do is receive the blessing of God as he gives them. Elijah, you've got to go because God's blessing cannot be controlled. They can only be received. You don't own God's blessing. All you can do is receive it as a gift. You don't realize it until I cut the supply off. It's one of the first lessons I learned in marriage that I do not own my wife. Ah. Uh, I received her as the gift that she is. I may have brought her a home. I may have brought her a ring, but I do not own her. You might pay the bills and control the finances, but you don't own anyone. We own things, or so we think. Not people. When it is that you realize that you don't own anything, it's freeing. If anything, it's freeing to your garage. You can park things. You can park your car where there were once things. When you realize that God is the source of your blessing and he entrusts it to you, if that's really true, then why do you worry so much when you lose something? When it is that we try to hoard God's blessing, it's not because we're good stewards. It's because we really don't trust him. And we hold on to the things that he's given us because we don't trust that he will supply our daily needs. The same thing we do with food. We do it with things and we do it with people. I'll hold on to the boot that you gave me, even when it's unhealthy and toxic. Not because I have faith, because I don't want to start over. I'd rather be miserable with them, the thing that's good 75% of the time, than be whole and get therapy by myself. I'm comfortable in this place, and I don't want to leave. So I'll set my aim and my goals low and stay in this comfortable place when you have something more in store for me. Some people intentionally set their aims low, and if you do that, you'll always reach your goal. But you can become so comfortable with the blessings of God in this season of your life that you will settle in your mind that this place is the place you're supposed to stay for the rest of your life. But God's expectation of you is based on his investment and contribution in you. 
And if you think that all that God has for you is eating and sleeping and working and acquiring things, then you've missed the boat. Maslow says, if you deliberately plan to be less than you are capable of being, then you will be deeply unhappy for the rest of your life. You will be evading your own capacities, your own possibilities. God has something better for you, but he has to make you uncomfortable before you're ready to receive it. We hoard the blessings of God. It's not new. It's not new. In Exodus chapter 16, verses 4 and 5, the Bible says, The Lord said to Moses when the people were complaining, God says, tell the people I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. And this way I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. For God, what about the Sabbath day? Well, he says, on the sixth day, you are to prepare what they bring in. And it will be twice as much as you gather on the other six days. You've been the slaves for 500 years. You hungry in the desert. God has already brought water from a rock. Now you hungry. He's going to rain down manna from heaven. Get what you need only for that day. When tomorrow comes, do the same thing. Uh, in verse 20. They, they tried to hoard the food. And when they woke up the next day, you can read it when you get home. If you even hold on to good things for too long, they will begin to stink and they will begin to rot. Elijah is learning what his mother and father taught him. That you have to depend upon God. But now, Elijah, you're going to learn for yourself. We know where Elijah is from, but none of his pedigree or past history can help him now. He's a prophet who's prophesied to the king, but none of it helps him now. He's a prophet who's commanded the heavens to turn to brass, but he still has to trust God for his daily needs. He speaks for God, but he still needs God to speak to him. When God blesses you, will you hoard his blessing or trust him for the next one? God gives you strength for the day's task. He gives you food for the day's need. They didn't have any refrigeration and walk-in pantries. God gives you enough, well, God gives you enough calories, ideally, to fulfill the day's responsibilities. God says, when I bless you, are you trusting me or the things that I give you? His parents taught him some stuff, but dependence upon God is learned in an experience with God. Verse 6 of 1 Kings 17 says, the raven brings him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. It dawns on Elijah that he is subject to the very word that he speaks to Ahab. He tells the king that there'll be no moisture of any kind except at his word. But when the brook dries up, there's no abracadabra that he can speak to bring water out of nothing. He is helpless because he cannot speak H2O into existence. He cannot take two hydrogen molecules and attach them to an oxygen molecule to get the water that has disappeared. He's not a superhero. He's not a mutant. He's not from another world or another realm. He is simply an ordinary human being who's nothing apart from God. God tells Elijah that he'll drink from the brook and the ravens will feed him. But Elijah does not know that the stream has been given enough water to supply him for a predetermined time. And he is subject 
to the same experience and the same drought as everybody else. The word of the Lord comes to him in verse 2 that directs him to the book. Well, brother, you better be glad that the word of God comes to you again because if it doesn't, you will die of dehydration and hunger just like everybody else. The thing he thought he needed wasn't the thing that he needed. The word of the Lord came to him. You see, um, Elijah, um, the reason why you got to go is because God is not a vending machine. Um, God is not a vending machine. If you put the correct change in the vending machine or swipe your card and, and push the button, you're supposed to get what you pay for. Um, the vending machine will give you what you want if you put in the right money. Um, but let the vending machine not give you what you want. And you can see it behind the clear glass. And you'll do like I did on Thursday at 125. I swiped my card, and when I didn't get my pretzels, I didn't have cash. I began to shake the vending machine and kick it, and then when somebody came and they saw my badge, maybe it's just me. When you pay for something, you expect to get it, and if you don't get it, it may be just me, I'm going to throw a fit. God says, I'm not a vending machine. I'm not a genie in a bottle. I will give you what you need when you need it. But Nico, you do not control me. I want you to trust me when I bless you. And I want you to trust me when your brook dries up. I want you to trust me in abundance. And I want you to trust me in drought. I want you to trust me when your stomach is full. And when your stomach is empty. Now go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. God's word kind of comes like mission impossible. God says, good morning, Mr. Elijah. Your mission, Elijah, should you choose to accept it, is for me to speak to you and through you. As always, should you or any of your prophets should be caught or killed, remember the hazards of the job. This vision will self-destruct in five seconds. Good luck, Elijah. I imagine if Elijah had a moment to think about it, he would try to get out. He would try to change occupations. But remember, God hasn't changed in the last three years. So I will leave to go where God is leading. God tells him to walk 70 miles from Cherith to Zarephath, a journey that will take approximately three and a half days. Walk hungry. Walk thirsty. Walk in drought through mountains, past dry rivers, to a town you've never heard of. Go there and stay there. The trip will take approximately 24 hours which will be bearable except one could maybe travel the distance in three and a half days under normal circumstances. But he has to leave and do it on an empty stomach without water and without food. He has to leave the blessed place. He has to leave the favored place and walk to a cursed, dry, pagan place. He says, leave the place that you grew up and go to a place you've never seen. Leave the comfortable place because it's become uncomfortable. Now it's time for you to go. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. But check it out, Elijah. Uh, you won't get it unless you leave. The fact that there is a widow Testing. the fact that there was a widow there at the edge of starvation speaks to the inequality that exists in the economy of Israel.
Interesting. It's all right. King Ahab and Queen Jezebel refuse to repent, and the political leader's callousness has a trickle-down effect on the rest of the people. But God says in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 28 and 29, that 10% of the produce of the land is supposed to be set aside Set aside in times of abundance, set aside for the Levites, the immigrants, the orphan, and the widows, so that they will be able to come and eat. Even though there is a drought, there is no reason for a single mother to have needs that cannot be met through the social services that God has set up in his own kingdom. She has no support system, even though God ordained for one. So if there's a single mother, if there's a widow who is poor and destitute and abject poverty in their neighborhoods, the burden is on them to erase it. And if the country don't do what God has ordained for them to do, God will arise a prophet to get up off of his high horse and say, arise and go. The reason why you have to go, Elijah, is because somebody is dependent upon your obedience. As Elijah stands up, he realizes that Cherith is a transition, not a destination. The book that God had destined for him is a transition. It's not a destination. I've taken care of you for three years. But this place is not the final place. This place was meant to prepare you for the next place. Never get so comfortable where you treat transitions like destinations. I, I left New York in 2001 and went to Oakwood, a place that I had never seen. A place I had never been. I, I heard about it. I went to their website. God said, go. Didn't have any money. Like half of the people who went to Oakwood didn't go to Pine Forge. Um, nobody knew who I was, but I knew that God had called me to ministry. I failed out of school twice. Had no money. Went to Oakwood. Went to graduate school. And I'm the type of person, I want a job by graduation, but I need to get it at least nine months ahead of time. So but when I when I graduated from, well, I didn't graduate from Andrews. When I walked in the graduation ceremony, I had a job lined up nine months before graduation day. And I was working in the hospital in Tennessee. And then I lined up another job in New Orleans. It was about three, at least three months ahead of time. So I'm in New Orleans and I'm dating this girl who will only live in the South. And I can get no job in the South. I was settling. That's another story. Uh, the only job that God opened up was a job in California, a place I had never been, a place I had only seen. So I go to California and I double my salary in about three years. I'm doing good, making six figures. I had, I, got, I, was, I had about three jobs making good money. Then I met this nurse who lived in Orlando, Florida. And her father asked me about moving to Florida. I said, no, I'm doing it big in California. No, no. Mm -mm. I, I'm a director. I'm a supervisor. Y'all, as soon as I, the brook began drying up. And what I thought was a destination was only a transition period for to prepare me to come here. Now, if God says go somewhere else, um, that's another conversation. But don't treat transitions like destinations because of pride. You have to learn how to live your life singing the song, I'm a pilgrim, I'm a stranger, I can tarry, I can tarry only a night. God tells Elijah, I have another transition for you. You've been comfortable for three years, but the transition I have ordained for you, you're not ready yet. 
the transition is not really for you. I have commanded a widow to feed you. Not so you can be full. But so you have enough strength to bless her. You've been in a drought. Eating good. She's been in a drought too. You're depressed wondering how you're going to make it. She's depressed and wondering how she's going to make it too. Both of you will die if you don't make a move. The place cherished is a destination. It's not a destination. It's a transition. He says, I want you to go there to meet a widow. Uh, I want you to meet her. Check it out. Because if she don't make it, you ain't going to make it. You are called by God. You are blessed by God. But your life will have no meaning. If she doesn't make it. You won't die. She's going to feed you. You're ordained to bless her. But if you stay at your place of transition. Treating it like a destination. Then nobody will make it. You make transitions. Destinations. Because we only care about ourselves. And protecting our own welfare. God says you got to go. Because you can't make it if she can't make it. There was a mother in Boston a few years ago. They lived in a high-rise apartment. Uh, a young teenage mother in the high-rise apartment. She had a toddler with her. And if you know anything about toddlers, you can turn your head for five seconds. They didn't climb up on the high cabinets. You ain't even, They can barely walk, but they can climb. You got to watch toddlers at all times, even if you have the baby gates. Got to watch them at all times. Uh, she didn't know that the toddler went out to the terrace. The toddler went out to the terrace, and she went out and brought the toddler back in. But as she was coming back into the living room, the whole, impart the whole apartment caught on fire. Her injuries were so severe that she might never be able to walk again. And she did what any mother would do. She grabbed her son and she jumped from the third story window as the fire inched closer. She had a choice to make when the fire was coming to her. But she took her baby and jumped out of a three story window, hit the ground. They interviewed her in the hospital. She had to have a six-hour surgery. The doctors didn't know if she was going to have permanent nerve damage. She says, I'm not doing anything great. I'm not doing that well. But what I was supposed to do, I did. I'm alive. I knew it was my only way out. I kissed him, and I told him I loved him, and then I jumped. She lost feeling in her legs when she hit the ground. Then she had to use her arms to crawl out of the way of falling debris as the building burned. And she told the reporter, it's so worth it. Because my son is okay. I had to go through six hour surgery. I don't know if I'm ever going to walk again. But it's amazing to see him perfectly fine. And playing with his grandma. The mother made a decision in her mind when she saw the building burning. And she says, I can't make it if he can't make it. I don't know if I can save myself, but I will make a choice to save him. I will choose for him to take my place. God says in Exodus 22, verses 22 and 23, he says, don't take advantage of the widow or the fatherless. If you do, and they cry out to me, I will certainly hear their cry. We need all of people, poor people, widowed, single mothers, able-bodied. We need the unrighteous and the righteous. If you don't make it, then I can't make it. Elijah, you've got to go. 
to where you're going. It's not about you. But you don't realize it if you treat transitions like destinations. She's struggling in silence while you're living under my blessing and my provision. You have a political and religious agenda with the palace. But I need you to leave your prophetic assignment and go meet the needs of a widow who's under drought and who's about to die. She's a single mother who's a widow. A widow is someone who's grieving the husband or spouse that has died. Grieving the past, but also grieving the future that won't come to be because of the financial responsibility that our husband carried with him to the grave. We grieve our past and we grieve our future. We grieve the anniversaries that we had, but we also grieve the parties that we won't be invited to. We grieve the partner that we lost, but we also grieve the children that we may not have with them. Elijah, you've got to go because the, this widow is carrying a burden and there's a chasm that nothing can fix because she has no marketable skills and now she's hungry just like you. Elijah, you've got to go because there's a mother in need, a mother who's trying to do the best that she can. She's cried out to me in prayer and I tried up the brook so you can be the answer to her prayer. If you don't go, nobody will. Verse number 10 says he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, a widow was there gathering sticks. Um, Elijah, she's going to help you, but you're coming to help her. She's crying out to me, and I'm sending you. I'm sending you because you probably wouldn't go unless I gave you a promise. You need to understand that God sees the answer to your problem before you realize you even have a problem. God provides for Elijah in the drought before the drought comes into being. God sends Elijah to the widow before the widow goes out to pick up sticks. God will provide for you and make a way for you, but oftentimes he will do it before your problem ever comes into being. He's not just an on-time God, but the reason why he's on time is because you're standing in your problem and he's standing in your future waiting for you to show up. Elijah, you've got to go not to bring God to the widow, but to catch up to where God already is. I need a God like that. What about you? A God who is where my problem is and where my answer is at the same time. And he's walking alongside me all the way. There's not a plant or flower below. But makes thy glories known. And clouds arise and tempests blow by order of thy throne. While all that borrows life from thee is ever in thy care. And everywhere we can be, thou God, you are present there. God is in your past. He's in your future waiting for you to show up. He is Jehovah Jireh, the God that provides. I can receive God's blessings one day at a time. I can risk my security in the hands of an all-loving, all-knowing, and all-powerful God. I can leave my place of comfort because he's in my future waiting on me to show up. You need to understand that one person's obedience can save a whole group of people. One person's obedience can save a whole group of people because Noah obeyed God. The world was saved from a flood because Abraham believed God. He became the father of many nations because Abraham interceded for Lot. His family was saved and the presence of Lot delayed God's judgment on an entire city. If one person obeys, 
that can shift the atmosphere for an entire group of people. Because Joseph obeyed God, the sons of Jacob was preserved from drought. Because Moses obeyed God, an entire people were set free. One person's obedience can be the answer to a whole group of people. But we also know, because we're good Bible students, that one person's disobedience can also mess up a whole group of people. In Romans 5, verses 18 to 21 says, Just as one trespass resulted in the condemnation for all people, so one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. So through the disobedience of one man, many were made sinners. Through the obedience of one man, many will be made righteous. The law was brought that sin might increase. But where sin does abound, grace does much more abound. So that just sin reigned in death, grace, grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You're saying, preacher, I ain't no theologian. I ain't never read Romans chapter 5. Let me break it down like this. Adam sinned, and the whole world was in drought, and just like the widow, we were destined to die. But thank God Jesus left heaven's throne to rescue me. Adam disobeyed, and I was born in sin and shaped in iniquity. But because Jesus obeyed, I am born again and renewed by the Spirit of God. In Florida... Um, South Florida, there was a lifeguard named Tomas Lopez. Tomas Lopez, he made the news for simply doing his job. He made the news for doing his job. But it wasn't the fact that he did his job. The fact was that he did it too well. Um, he was sitting on his chair, and the beachgoers ran to tell him that somebody was drowning, like I said, he made the news not for saving somebody. He made the news because he got fired for doing it. Company policy says that lifeguards cannot go beyond the perimeter of the beach they are responsible for overseeing. The man was 1,500 feet outside of his assigned zone in an area where signs were present warning visitors not to swim, and if they do it, it's at their own risk. Even though he was violating policy, Lopez ran into the ocean and pulled the struggling man ashore. He said, as soon as I grabbed the man's hands, I knew I was going to be fired. I knew I had broken the rule because when that happens, you're supposed to call 911 and hope they get there in time. The man did his job, helped somebody who obeyed, Went beyond his job description, saved a man who broke the law, who didn't ask to be saved. He did it knowing the penalty. Like I said, I know you've been saved your whole life, but, but not me. I was sinking deep in sin, and I was far from the peaceful shore. I was very deeply stained within, and I was sinking to rise no more. When the master of the sea, when he heard my despairing cry, he jumped up and he left his life jacket. He left his rescue donut. All he had was his divinity wrapped in humanity. And when he left the boundaries of heaven and he came to the Milky Way, and as he approached Earth's atmosphere, the devil says, you're entering my zone. You're intruding upon my world. But Jesus said, Negro, get behind me, Satan. While I was drowning, he jumped into Mary's womb. And he was born of a virgin. And when I needed CPR, he died on Golgotha's hill. And when he got out of the borrowed tomb, he breathed life into my lungs. His divinity reached my gasping humanity. His oxygenated blood began pumping in my ventricles and atria. He rescued me from the water. When the demons tried to fire him, when they tried to discourage him, when they tried to make him turn around, he says, I'm going to save him come hell or high water. I'd rather be in hell with him than in heaven without him. When you touch him, you're touching the apple of my eye. I've got 